Welcome to Hey on Haven. I'm Dawn. Today we're discussing chapter 24 of the Tale of Genji, Kocho, Butterflies. We'll start with our usual summary for shared context. It was after the 20th day of the third month, and Murasaki's spring garden was lovelier than ever. Genji built two Chinese-style boats and arranged a flower viewing excursion for the Empress's gentlewomen and some of Murasaki's. There was music played long into the night. Rumors about Tamakazura spread, and suitors began to press their case, Genji's brother chief amongst them. The empress sponsored a sutra reading, and Murasaki provided the flower offering via page girls dressed as birds and butterflies. This was Murasaki's answer to the challenge Her Majesty had issued in the fall, and this exchange was the beginning of frequent correspondence between Murasaki and Akiko Nomo. Murasaki and Tamakazura had been corresponding since they met during the mumming in the middle of the first month. Genji had not chosen a favorite among Tamakazura's suitors and considered informing Tono Chujo about his daughter so that he could court her. Yugiri, Genji's son, continues to treat her as a sister and her real brother, not knowing her origin, and many others continue to send letters. Genji presses Tamakazura to answer specific letters, pontificating on how he judged a woman based on her reply and how quickly it came, and questions her about a letter tied in a knot. After reinforcing that she is not established enough to contact her father, Genji goes on to advise Tamakazura about some of her suitors. Genji becomes increasingly infatuated with Tamakazura, even speaking to Murasaki about her. His visits to her quarters become more frequent, until one night, when he caught her off guard, she reminded him so much of her mother that he took her by the hand and confessed his feelings to her. He laid down next to her, she cried, and he rebuked her before trying to comfort her, oscillating between those two extremes until he left. Tamakazura was devastated, and her gentlewoman thought she was ill. Genji sent a morning after letter, which she politely declined to answer in full, feigning illness. He then flooded her with letters until she felt so hounded that she really did fall ill. Have you ever hated a character? Genji's behavior is deplorable, and I'm very much looking forward to chapter 42. For this chapter, our translators all agree on quite a lot, including the title, Butterflies. Let's discuss some of the differences as well as similarities. Our first difference is small and in the first line. Whaley and Seidensticker say we are late in and at the end of the third month. Tyler and Washburn are more specific, placing us after the 20th day of the third month. Genji had two boats or barges made in the Chinese style. All our translators agree to that, but Tyler and Washburn disagree on one thing. The prow of one of the boats is built to resemble a dragon's head, and the other was either a blue heron, according to Washburn, or a rock, a giant mythical bird, according to Tyler. When the gentlewomen disembark the boats after their flower viewing excursion, the interplay of the varied colors of their gowns caught my attention, and it struck me as a good opportunity to see how close these translations are. Whaley says, there was such an interweaving of gay colors as would have been hard to outdo. Seidenstecker elaborates, the lengths to which the competitive young women had gone with their dress and grooming made one think of a tapestry upon which blossoms had fallen. That's quite the difference. Like Seidenstecker's tapestry with blossoms, Tyler uses floral brocade, saying, the young women from each side, all dressed to uphold their pride, and very pretty too, presented the beauty of a floral brocade. Washburn also uses brocade as a descriptor and captures a bit of all of the other translators. Conscious of not wanting to look inferior to the others, all of the young women had gone to great trouble with their makeup and choice of clothing, and they presented a scene every bit equal to the springtime brocade of mingling blossoms and flowers. The day after the flower excursion was the sutra reading. This sutra reading wasn't a single instance. Washburn says that the sutra reading was the first of four days of reading the Sutra of the Perfection of Wisdom. In a footnote, Washburn expands to say, this type of ceremony could be held at the palace or at an aristocratic house. If at the palace, it was performed in the Shishinden by 100 priests. All of our translators agree that Murasaki's flower offering was carried by eight pages, four birds carrying cherry blossoms and silver vases, and four butterflies carrying yamabuki in gold vases. Here's the difference. Whaley once again insists that these pages are page boys. 
Everyone else knows better and translated its page girls. Another ambiguous thing, Whaley says the birds and butterflies dance, but the other translators do not state or imply that. The last translation item, another similarity, that I'd like to talk about is how the uncomfortable interaction between Genji and Tamakazura is handled. Seidenstecker's version, he threw off his robe with practice skill and pulled her down beside him. This version catches the uncomfortable nature of the scene and makes sense to me. We were told that Tamakazura stood up, blushing from embarrassment. We know she was wary of Genji, and there's nothing to indicate that she sat down while he held her hand and told her of his feelings. Pulled her down beside him is probably the more accurate movement, but neither Tyler nor Washburn are that explicit, saying he lies down beside her. All three later translators use skill or skillful to describe the way Genji removes his outer robe without making a sound. Whaley is the outlier. Here is his version. Almost without her being aware of what was happening, he slipped from her shoulders the light cloak which she had been wearing since summer came in and lay down beside her. Whaley has the garment being removed from Tamakazura, not Genji. Either way, she was horrified and I have yet another reason to despise Genji, and more widely, the plight of women everywhere for the past thousand years dealing with identical or similar situations. In this chapter, we have two seasons, late spring and the start of summer. Spring is well represented in the descriptions of Murasaki's garden, and the plants highlighted are those most associated with spring, willow, yamabuki, wisteria, and of course cherry blossoms, which have somehow lasted longer in her garden than the blossoms anywhere else. Our other seasonal references are within the clothing references, specifically in the kasane, layered color pairings. The gifts that the birds and butterflies are presented with match the flower offerings that they were carrying. Gowns in white over red for the birds who carried the cherry blossoms, and the butterflies received dead leaf tan over yellow, a yamabuki layering. That's spring well represented. For summer, we have the description of what Tamakazura is wearing, a robe in the pink style under a stylish robe that represents the flower of the season, unohana, or dutsia, which blooms in early summer in clusters of white blossoms. We'll come back to this outfit. We're also flatly told that the first day of the fourth month, the beginning of summer, is marked by a change in dress. In the manual created for Empress Taishi, we learn that the fourth month marks a change not only in color, but also in the weight of silk worn. Summer garments were thin robes, they were sheer. Washburn remarks that Genji can see Tamakazura's delicate skin through her sheer summer robe. One of the reasons the flower excursion was arranged was to allow the Empress's gentlewoman to see what she herself could not. She had restrictions upon her movements that prevented a casual trip to see flowers. Her gentlewoman would be able to tell her about everything they saw and show her Murasaki's largesse, the lavish gifts that were presented to everyone on the excursion. I found it interesting that for the sutra reading, the musicians were seated in a foreign fashion in folding chairs. These musicians were rewarded according to their rank, those of higher rank receiving white robes and the others receiving bolts of silk. In that same scene, Yugiri, Genji's son, who carried Murasaki's poem answer to the Empress's challenge, was given a lavender robe lined in blue and a set of women's robes. Whaley calls this a blue jacket. When the gentlewomen are being rowed along the garden lake, the young boys operating the boat were potentially dressed in Chinese costume, according to Whaley and Seidenstecker. All four translators mentioned their hair being done up in loops. Genji's celebration of Murasaki's garden concluded at dawn, the women dispersed, and the courtiers who were staying on for the Empress's sutra reading withdrew and changed into appropriate clothes, what Tyler calls full civil dress. Basically, everyone needed to be in formal, sober robes for the reading. Let's go back to Tomokazura's summer outfit. The bottom robe, which Tyler calls hosonaga, is a plum pink with a leaf green lining. What is a hosonaga? Good question. It seems that this garment is disputed. The term seems to refer to both swaddling clothes and a piece of formal wear for young women. Obviously, on Tamakazura, this would be the latter. It's described as like karaginu, the men's robe, but in the images from the Costume Museum in Kyoto, link down below, the garment looks to me more like a woman's karaginu, only much longer. I'm reminded of a woman's karaginu because of the collar, specifically the way it folds back, 
and most especially the triangular center back. You can see from this image what I mean by both of those. I don't understand why a Hosonaga would be worn with a Koichigi over it if it looks like the image of the costume museum. The Koichigi that she's wearing is in the Unohana style, white over green. Keep in mind this is summer, so the robe was sheer. The green shining through the white created a frosted pale green color. I'm increasingly intrigued by what seems to be pairing of robes rather than the more formal layerings that include the five Uchiki and specific color layerings, Kasane no Irome. And of course, in chapters like this one, I'm very grateful to have the clothing to focus on because dwelling on Genji's behavior just gets me riled up. What stood out for you in this chapter? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for chapter 25, Hotaru. Subscribe if you'd like to explore the Heian period of Japan with me through the tale of Genji.